Hello and welcome to Sake Revolution, America's first sake podcast. I am your host, John Puma, sake nerd at large, founder of sakenotes.com and administrator of the internet sake discord. And I'm your host, Timothy Sullivan. I'm a sake samurai, sake educator, and the founder of the Urban Sake website. And together, John and I will be tasting and chatting about all things sake. So Tim, we made it through a very, very difficult topic last week. The topic of unf- mm-hmm. um, Nigori. Mm-hmm. And I have a feeling that the Sake Education Corner, it's going to need some new blood this week. Well, now that we know all about sake classifications, I thought it might be fun to do a series on sake production. You know, sake has a lot of production steps, and it's a little bit complicated, but I thought it would give us a lot to talk about. Excellent. So, um, all right. So there are many, many steps, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Where do you want to start? Well, I think it makes sense to start with rice. Rice is nice. Rice. I'm on board. Let's do this. Yeah. Well, I think if you stopped anybody on the street in Midtown, in Middle America, anywhere, and you asked them, what do you know about sake? The word rice would definitely come up. So I think that this is kind of central to everything revolving around sake. Yeah. Once we're allowed to do that, uh, we should put this to the test and find (laughs) random people and ask them that. Yeah. We have to take sake revolution on the road as soon as we can get back out there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, That would be that would be fun. Yeah. I'd love to do a live interview on the street. (laughs) You there. What do you know about sake? (laughs) I say sake. You say what? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, so, uh, so we're going to talk about rice. Um, let's get into it then. What do you want? What, what do we want to say about rice? Well, you know, one of the very first things we talked about on this show, episode one, we talked about rice milling and after the rice is milled, we have to do what we call raw material preparation. And it Mm -hmm. is prepping the rice in order to put it on all the following steps that we need. And we need to prep the rice in a very specific way. And there's three main things that we do. So I thought it might be fun to talk about after the rice is milled, what do we do with it? And the first thing is washing. You got to wash the rice. Have so you, we can't have dirty rice. Can't have dirty rice. <laughs> okay. Uh, have you ever made uh, sushi rice at home? Uh, I've not made sushi rice at home, but I've made plenty of rice at home and and i always always step one wash the rice right i think a lot of people know to do that now and well tell me about what you do when you wash the rice well um i measure out the amount of rice i'm going to be using for my for my rice cooker um i'll put it in the uh in the bowl and then i will i will turn my faucet onto the into into its wash setting which it has and i will i'll go over it all with uh, cold water while I run my hands through and just try to get all the excess starches off of the rice. And then I will pour out the excess water and maybe do it again, depending on how much uh, it looks like they're still coming off at the end. Yeah. So you see the water turning kind of cloudy, right? Totally. Yeah. So surprise, surprise, that is exactly what we do in the world of sake, just on a larger scale. So we're going to take the rice uh, you, you have to agitate it and you have to run cold water over it. And what we're doing is we're taking off the rice powder. So from milling, whether you have the sushi rice that you milled or the sake rice that the, uh, the machine milled, you have to get that powder off. So washing is the first critical step. I remember the very first month I was at the brewery. I worked at Hakkaisan Brewery for a year mm-hmm. and they had me working in the rice washing facility. And one thing they assigned me to do was to wash the little test batches. So they would do a test batch every day to kind of test, you know, the, the, the temperature, the humidity, uh, the temperature of the water, and they would make sure that everything was in the right state before they did a very large batch of rice to wash it. Because the temperature changes every day, the humidity changes every day. Uh, and they just want to make sure that everything's uh, kosher and going to be correct. So one of the things I got to do was wash these little test batches. And um, I have to tell you, that water is cold. We would put <laughs> our arm in up to the elbow and swirl the rice in a big vat. And uh, 
my arm was really, really numb at the end of that. I, I don't go that, water. I don't go quite that in depth. <laughs> and then, yeah, maybe it's because I'm not making that volume of rice at home. <laughs> yeah, but uh, that's the same thing we do. We, um, you know, we look at uh, the, how clear the water is and you begin to see the next time you do it at home, if you're washing rice, after a few rounds of washing and rinsing, you're going to see that the rice starts to absorb some water and it actually changes color. It becomes more bright white. I don't know if you've ever noticed that or not, but mm, I've only time, done like two rounds. Try eight. Try eight. Yes. Try eight. Um, see how clear you can get the water next time, because uh, I experiment with that all the time. I have a rice cooker, too, and I mm -hmm. do it again and again and again and again and again and again. And uh, it it's amazing how much starch powder can come off the rice. Hmm. All right. Now I have a new uh, <laughs> a new little project for, <laughs> for my quarantine. My wife's going to give me oh, you're still watching the rice. It's been a half hour. <laughs> Tim well, told me I need to watch it eight times. Won't take that long. And <laughs> the other thing that's important is to use cold water. Mm -hmm. So picture me with my my arm elbow deep in the in the ice cold uh, mountain in, stream water. In the, the mountain, the, the Nagata mountain water. Yes. <laughs> Very lovely. Yeah. If you use water that's too warm, it's actually going to hasten the softening of the grain. And at this point, when you're washing the rice, you don't want to soften the grain. You just want to get that powder off and start right. to introduce just a bit of moisture. Okay, Tim, my rice is washed. It's very, the, it's clean. The water is coming off of it as clean as it came out of the faucet. Now what? So you've done it at least eight times, right, John? Eight times. <laughs> I'm getting very it's dirty looks. More. What do I do with it now? <laughs> okay, after washing, the next step is soaking. And the, the funniest thing about the soaking step is that they actually time you with a stopwatch. So with a stopwatch, when, the stopwatch, I'm not okay. joking. When you go to the brewery, they have the washing and soaking stations right next to each other. And there's always these stopwatches hanging on the wall. And when I first thought that, I'm like, what are we going to do? Be running laps or something like that? What's going on? So they use the stopwatch to actually time how long the rice is in the water. And again, this water is ice, ice cold, really, really cold water. And the purpose of soaking is to penetrate water to the very core of the rice grain. If you soften the rice first by soaking to a very specific point, uh, it will um, cook much better. It'll soften much better when you steam it. Mm. So uh, soaking usually takes about 10 minutes. All right. I, you know, it's funny. I think um, in a few episodes back when we were talking about Nama, we discussed briefly my visit to Dewazakura this year. And one of the things that we did get to see was the soaking process for their, their Junmai Daikinjo. And the, the gentleman whose job it was to, to soak the rice was being very, very meticula meticulous about watching, pulling some of it out of the water, shaking it around, taking a look, bring it back in, pulling it out, checking it, shaking it back, shake it up a little bit, bring, and constantly and checking his watch, checking a stopwatch until the exact moment when it was exactly the way he wanted it. Yep. And what they're checking, what they do is they sometimes they put a little wooden paddle in the water and they bring a few of the grains up on the paddle without taking it out of the water, but they bring it right to the surface and they look and they're watching that transformation from kind of the grayish white of hard rice to the more bright white of the moisture infused rice. So when it starts to take on more and more moisture into the grain, uh, the color, the brightness of the grain actually changes. And that's what they're looking for, to see this visual cue to how much water's gone in. And then when they're ready, they have to pull it right away. So they're very, very meticulous in it. And they've got the rice in like a, in like a basket, like mm -hmm. a sieve very fine sieve. So the rice is in there just soaking. They don't touch it. They don't move it. And they just let it sit there and soak. And then when they're ready, when stopwatch goes off or when the master brewer says it's time, they pull it up and then they, they put it uh, usually on a crate or something and they let the water run off and just drain off at that point. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't even need that water anymore. No. <laughs> so now that my water's uh, been is clean, it is as clean as it's gonna get. Yep. It is now soaked to the 
exact amount that we want, what's next? Well, uh, the final step for this uh, raw materials preparation is actually rice steaming. And if, right. you, if you don't steam the rice, it's not going to be any good for you during fermentation. Uh, steaming is uh, done a couple different ways. Usually um, some, some breweries use a round steamer, like a, it's called a koshiki, and it's actually like a giant soup can, and steam comes up from below. Mm -hmm. uh, another way is a conveyor belt method, where they put rice onto this conveyor belt that goes through these chambers that are all pressurized with steam. So there's different ways they can uh, steam the rice, but either way, generally 45 minutes to an hour, uh, the rice gets steamed, and uh, we don't when I was growing up, we would always boil rice in my household. <laughs> uh, but for the world of sake, we do rice steaming. Yeah, I would think that perhaps the, the needs of, uh, of an American kitchen are a little bit different from the needs of a world-class sake brewery. <laughs> Absolutely. The critical thing that happens when you steam the rice is called gelatinization. Mm. That's a, that's a lovely term. <laughs> uh, I assume that we want the rice to get soft. And, yes. and dare I say, gelatinous. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, gelatinization is actually the, kind of like the unfurling of the starch. So if you put starch that, that is not softened into the vat with yeast, it's not going to break down. Uh, you need the starch to be bioavailable. So the steaming actually unlocks the, the starch and it allows the koji to go in there and break down the starch into sugar. If we didn't treat the rice with this steam and kind of unfurl these uh, starch molecules, then we would not be able to break it down into sugar. So it's a very, very critical step. Uh, steaming must be done. And again, as I mentioned, about 45 minutes to an hour. So now we've washed the rice. We soaked it for a bit, mm -hmm. and now we have steamed it and caused gelatinization. That's right. <laughs> uh, so at that point, the rice is ready to go. We're ready. Finally. Finally, we're okay. ready to go. So that Fantastic. is, those are the three waypoints of raw material preparation. So in this case, rice is our raw material for making sake, and the prep is these three steps. Each one is very, very meticulous. And the breweries that I have visited and worked at, there's one dude in charge of each of these areas. So there's like a person in charge of washing, person in charge of soaking, and person in charge of steaming. And those guys are watching over their step like a hawk. And when it works, <laughs> it puts the rice in the perfect position for moving on to fermentation. All right. Um, Speaking of moving on. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think we've got some sake. All right. Yeah. And um, so our theme this week, uh, unless I'm mistaken, is that we, since we're talking all about rice, we brought a couple of sakes that were made with particular rices that we want to talk about. That's right. There's um, around 100 strains of sake rice. So that would be a whole series of <laughs> unto itself. Uh, but we did each bring a sake that uh, had an interesting rice that we want to talk about. And uh, so why don't, why don't you go first and introduce the sake that you have? Well, I have a sake that uses an heirloom rice. Now, uh, for those at home who are not familiar, uh, heirloom rice is, it's like the OG of rice. It is not, uh, there's no uh, genetic parentage to try and consider. It's not crossbred with anything. It is, it's an original sake rice. And in this case, it's omachi, which is, unless I'm mistaken, and, and, and you're the sake samurai, so please correct me if I'm wrong, it is the original sake rice. Well, we call it the grandfather of sake rice. The grandfather of sake rice. Yes. All right. Not that all sake rice is descendant from omachi, mm -hmm. but omachi is a naturally occurring sake rice. Well, I uh, fell in love with this style of rice a long time ago when I was first kind of getting into it and realizing that, that the rice that's used matters because I 
didn't know any of this um, when I was first drinking sake. I just thought it was you know, rice, and I didn't even know they had to wash it for eight minutes. So, <laughs> um, at one point, I did come across a bottle, and the I, I tasted the sake, and I was like, "This is this is amazing. This is different than anything I've had before." And I spun it around, and the back of it said "Omachi," and I was, mm. "What is? What does that mean?" And I asked the I asked the waitress, I'm like, what is what does this omachi mean? And she's like, Oh, that's that's the kind of rice that's used. And I made like a mental note. I'm like, okay, whenever mm-hmm. I come across something that says omachi, I need to have it. And yeah. you know, years later and, and many rices, uh, I'm still a big fan. Yeah. Um, so cool. Uh, but 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 enough about the rice. The sake is actually uh Kurushi Junmai Ginjo from uh, Wakayama. And they very proudly use uh, omachi in, I think, in all of their sake, if I'm not mistaken. Awesome. Very yeah. good. Well, I brought a sake from Hiroshima. Mm. Um, this is Kamotsuru Iteki Nyukon Junmai Ginjo. All right. I don't think I've had that one before. So tell me yeah. a little bit. What do, they, what do you have on that? Well, um, the reason I picked this one is because I've never had it before either. Oh, and I really wanted to try it. And I brought it to our rice prep episode because this uses an interesting rice as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hiroshima has kind of a, a native sake rice that's known specifically from that region. And that's called Hatan Nishiki. Hatan Nishiki. Hatan Nishiki. And that rice is well known for growing a little bit shorter in stature than other sake rices. So it's a little bit easier to manage for the rice farmers. And um, I've also heard it's a bit more resistant to diseases, but it's a very, very regional rice. And uh, it is something that is specific to um, mainly to Hiroshima. So I'm very excited to try this sake and uh, talk a little bit about Hatan Nishiki. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to open up this Kurushi, which, by the way, that's the, the Black Bull. And their label has a very, very clearly has a silhouette of a, of a Black Bull on it. Um, they, know, they know what they're doing. So, John, this is the Junmai? This is the Junmai Ginjo. The Junmai Ginjo. Okay. Yeah, this was this was the first of their uh, of their sakes that I was introduced to, and it's still my favorite. So one of the things about omachi is that it is very rich. Uh, so when you're smelling a sake that that is made from omachi, it's not going to be as fruity. It's that you're not going to get a lot of fruit on the nose, but it's also not going to be tremendously ricey either. It's it's not it's not like um, it's like those, those Niigata rices. Um, <laughs> in this case, um, there isn't a huge aroma, which is kind of weird. It's like if you you could smell, you know, well, maybe a little bit of a little bit of cooked rice, but not, you know, nothing too nothing too crazy. And then, you know, when we taste it, it is, it is rich. Like that is like the word that I associate with, uh, with omachi. It's rich. It goes well with food usually. Um, you know, you you can probably have omachi sake with a lot more, uh, a lot wider range of food than you could with a lot of other sakes. This is for somebody who uh, comes on the show every week and talks about how much he likes very floral sipping stuff. To come on and be like, oh, and also my favorite rice is omachi is. <laughs> I, I understand that there's some cognitive dissonance there, <laughs> um, but there's a there's a special place in my heart for it, and this is this this loves food. It does have some uh, full bodied action going on. It's very rich. It's very you know it's just you know what it is a little bit ricier than I remember to be completely honest, but it is it's nice and hearty and tasty. And now I want to eat food with it. Probably rice, based on our conversation earlier, but I don't know if I have enough time to rinse it. Eight times. <laughs> Eight times. <laughs> At least. At least. <laughs> Definitely don't have time. <laughs> well, John, I have a confession. Oh, what's that? I am a big Omachi fan, too. 
But I'm coming. But you out also of the like fruity sakes. <laughs> I'm coming out of the closet as an Omachi fan on this show. I love Omachi as well, and I think for anyone out there who is interested in Omachi, you just have to try it. Right? It's like oh, such absolutely. a distinct flavor. I think of all the sake rices that are out there, Omachi has the most signature and distinct flavor. I don't know if you'd agree with that, but. I do, and it's difficult to this day in not, it's difficult for me to explain what Omachi tastes like because it's so signature as Omachi. It's, you know, it's kind of like trying to describe the color blue. It's very difficult because you just know it's blue. And that's yeah there's that it is definitely uh, and, and and other different breweries and different sakes will use that in different ways and it's going to um it's going to present differently but there's that that note it's always there mm-hmm. and it's it's always it's something special it's something unique and interesting yeah the word i use to describe what you're talking about is layered mm, okay. layered layered like there's a depth there's a depth to omachi sakes that has a, a a layered nuance it's not a simple clean flavor there's a, a it's a deeper flavor it's rice and umami kind of mixed together mm. and uh it's it's uh has hints of savoriness for me like a little bit of a savory note and uh, just really distinct and really delicious it is also the kind of sake that when you sip on it and just kind of let it linger in your mouth, it's going to change. It's going to take you on a journey. It's not, it's not going to be one and done. It's, <laughs> it's not going to be, oh, I taste the fruit, and then it gets a little dry, and then we're done. Like, no, there's so much going on. And I think a lot of people might interpret it a little bit differently, which is also really interesting. It's a nice little conversation piece then. <laughs> Yeah, it's just fantastic. I encourage anybody out there to uh, get your hands on a sake that uses omachi rice and uh, give it a try. The origins of omachi sake rice come from Okayama Prefecture. That's where that original sample of omachi was discovered. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's grown in several parts of Japan, but I think the the spiritual home for omachi is really okayama prefecture i've heard that and i feel like whenever i have sake from okayama it's nine out of ten of them are going to be omachi they're very (laughs) proud of their local sake rice there as they should be very much they should be it's so awesome yeah so enough about omachi for now for now yes yes let's talk about the special regional rices of Hiroshima. All right, so I'm going to open this Kamotsuru. And now, give it if a I'm pour. not mistaken, Tim, uh, Kamotsuru is one of the sake breweries that is located in Saijo. Is that accurate? That's correct. Okay. Ding, ding, ding. So Saijo. Oh, do you want right. to tell uh, tell everyone about Saijo? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, probably know more than I do which is uh, well I, I've been there have, have so you been there I have okay so I probably know just the same amount as you do Saijo uh-huh. is a neighborhood in uh, Hiroshima city and it is the uh, center for sake brewing production and if you walk around this neighborhood you can see several sake breweries all in the same general area and they all have these smokestacks where the steam comes out when they're steaming their rice and very often the smokestacks are made of brick and they have the name of the brewery written in white letters on there. So it's very picturesque to walk around and see all these breweries within walking distance of each other. So it's basically the, the home of sake brewing for Hiroshima City. They also have an annual festival in Saijo where they celebrate the local sake, the local breweries, um, but also sake from all over Japan. And it's a, it's a, very very big event uh takes over the entire city uh people can walk through and see all of the breweries um a lot of people are having a lot of street food uh street food and sake and it's uh it's quite an experience i recommend 
uh, trying to get down there if you ever have the opportunity. Yeah, it's amazing. So when, when things go back to normal, we're, we'll do an episode from the Saijo Saka Matsuri <laughs> in the future. Maybe season two will get there. Season two, all on location to make up <laughs> yes. for season one, which has nothing <laughs> on location. Exactly. Okay, so I have this Kamotsuru Iteki Nyukon Junmai Ginjo. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see, we're going to give this a smell. Mm, so it has a little bit of a ricey note to it. Mm -hmm. Yep, a little bit of like uh, straw, a little ricey, and just a hint of fruit in the back. Um, really interesting aroma. Hmm. Wow, it's always, I don't know if you experienced it, this, John, but when you taste a sake you've never had before the, for the very first time, you're kind of like, what, what's going on? What's this? I, oh, and what is this all about? You know, when you've tasted a sake for a hundred times, you kind of know what to expect. And uh, it, it, it always requires for me a little bit more uh, pause and concentration when I taste a sake I've never had before. This one has um, a, a noticeably dry finish on it. There's a little bit mm -hmm. of heat on the finish, a little bit of dryness. The aroma is primarily grain and rice, a little bit of steamed rice with uh, just a hint of a back note of something fruity, something melony. Mm. Yep. Uh, primarily what I come away with for this sake is a, is a dry finish. The the palate, the, the taste of it is quite balanced and a little bit more on the ricey side. So I would say overall, this is a dry sake and I am getting some heat on the finish. So it does make me want to nibble on something yeah, along with this sake. That, yeah, that sounds very food friendly and a little bit, mm. um, it sounds like something that, a little less sipping, a little bit more, uh, a little more accompanying a dish. Yeah, and I am not against a dry sake. Uh, I, I, I think neither of us are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We do not discriminate. No. Fruity, dry. We will definitely have <laughs> favorites, but... We have favorite children, but <laughs> yes, exactly. we won't discriminate. <laughs> no, not at all, not at all. Um, that sounds interesting. It sounds nice. I I find that a lot of the, um, a lot of the sake from Saijo specifically is very um, rice forward to me. Mm. Uh, yeah. Whereas some of the breweries that are in Hiroshima outside of that specific town mm. have a much more, uh, have a much broader collection of flavors to them. And that mm. might just be uh, some, some from bias based on when I've tasted things, but it's just something, it's just a feeling I get from, uh, from experiences there. It's interesting though. I like that. Yeah. What would you pair with your omachi as far as food, food goes? <laughs> um, I have paired I have paired this omachi with everything, uh, to be completely honest. It, it's one of those sakes that really is very versatile when it comes to food. You can mm -hmm. have it with such a variety at this particular moment. And it might just be because I haven't had it in a long time. Uh, right now. I'm thinking yakitori. Oh, now you're talking my language. Yeah. And it, it's, it's like, you can get, we can get so many things delivered right now, but yakitori has got to be the hardest thing because you really want to have it like right after it comes off the grill, and you, and that's just not an option right now when you're when this in this delivery uh, delivery only world we're in. Yeah, cold yakitori <laughs> is a bummer. It doesn't necessarily it doesn't mean it's cold when it arrives at your place, but it's still not going to be it's not going to be mm. fresh off the grill. Maybe I should, yeah. maybe I need a grill. Hmm. <laughs> All right. And some charcoal. Some char I'm gonna, after I'm done washing and, my and rice nine times, I'm going to get a charcoal grill <laughs> and hope, and, and a backyard. backyard, and hope that my, I'll just put the grill out the window and hope that my co-op doesn't kick me out. <laughs> I've had fantasies about making yakitori on my fire escape, but I don't want the fire department showing up. <laughs> 
That's they're going to eat all my yakitori <laughs> if they show up. Yes, and you'll get evicted, and they're going to eat yakitori. So you'll get this zero for two. You're going to lose your apartment and not get to eat. You'll be hungry and homeless. <laughs> It'll be worth it though. <laughs> well, I'll say I'll say the omachi made me do it. <laughs> so you're going to bribe the fireman with the omachi. This is getting worse, Tim. I don't like where this is going. <laughs> Well, when the judge throws the book at me, I'll say the Omachi made me did it, yeah. do it. The Omachi made me do it, Your <laughs> Honor. Um, do you know the rice milling percentage of your sake? Uh, so it looks like that's 50. 50%? Yeah. Oh. 50%. Wow. So that lower rice milling rate, I think, really lends to kind of the smooth character of the sake. It really gives it a smooth edge. Yeah, wouldn't you it, say it does a little bit? I mean, this particular one um, is is a little honestly a little less smooth, uh, but I think that's just a matter of I think that's what the brewery is going for here. I think they want something mm -hmm. that's going to be a little bit more, a little bit bigger, a little bit more exciting. I mean, don't get me wrong, I could sip this all day, um, mm. but this does really just like makes me want to eat. <laughs> Yeah, I don't mean quiet. I just mean smooth. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I, I, I can see that. Smooth sipping. Yeah. Yes. My my sake, my kamotsuru junmai ginjo, is milled to 60% mm -hmm. remaining. So I think uh, that isn't as finely milled as yours. Uh -huh. So I think that's where I get a little bit more of this ricey characteristic. Um, you know, revisiting it now, taking a second sip a few minutes later. It, it really uh, does have more of a pronounced riciness on the mm -hmm. palate. And again, the dry finish is still sticking with me. So it's a very food, I would call this a food friendly sake for sure. It sounds like it and it sounds, it sounds very much like it. Um, what would you pair it with? And mm. you can't say yakitori, I already used that. <laughs> I can't say yakitori, I'm gonna get arrested. The fire department's gonna come. <laughs> yes. um, so uh, let me see, well, you know, I'm going to say something. This is not my favorite food in the world, mm -hmm. but I'm ready. what pops to mind that I think would be a good pairing is ramen. So, what kind of ramen? Well, just like uh, I really like uh, shio ramen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm one of those weird aliens from another planet that, you know, ramen's not my favorite food. So many people I know are like, you don't like ramen? Are you human? And I, mean, I don't hate ramen, but it's not my favorite food. Uh, but with this sake, ramen sounds really good. It's got. I'm gonna a, say, I'm gonna say, Tim, that that's very surprising to me that you don't like ramen. <laughs> now uh -oh. I realize that you just—it's not your favorite food, but I, uh, I'm just—I guess I always assumed you did. That's interesting. We've been friends for all these years, yeah, and now you know the truth. Yeah, well, I, all these years we've never met up at a ramen shop, so maybe there's something to that. This is a true confessions episode. Oh, man. Yes. So I ramen's not my favorite, but I do appreciate uh, good shio ramen every now and again. I knew people in Japan who would eat ramen every day. Like, it was their favorite food. Like, they needed ramen to exist. <laughs> I'm just not, not at that point. It, given the calorie content of my favorite type of ramen i don't think i can eat it every day or i would die what's your favorite type of ramen uh like hakata style tonkatsu ramen oh wow like it is like you're tipping the scales like 1200 calories a bowl i think it's, Whoa! it's not it's not messing around <laughs> and that's your favorite it's so good it's so good and it's one of my favorite sake pairings but we'll get into that another day yeah do you agree that ramen's like good drunk hungover, hangover food? Ramen is the Japanese version of the uh, of the egg and cheese sandwich. Yes, the breakfast sandwich, because it's it's specifically this type of ramen. So you've got the pork broth. So uh, and then also you have your you have your pork broth and your chashu in there. So you're getting your pork. There's uh, a lot of fats in the broth. There's a start, you know, there's the, the carbs from the noodles and it's all coming in. It's, it's, it's from a taking care of your hangover standpoint it is the Japanese version of that egg and cheese breakfast sandwich, that, that hangover sandwich that people have in New York all the time. 
Yeah, so you got all the major food groups in there. That's that's mm-hmm. fantastic. Yeah. Oh, I want to have one ramen now. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I can't have ramen either. I can't have nagatori. I can't have ramen. Uh, damn you, COVID. Yes. <laughs> I miss sushi. I miss sushi. I didn't think I would, but I really miss, like, fresh, delicious, high-end omakase sushi. That's something yeah. that you really can't take yeah, you out. You can't do omakase unless you, like, you know. They stand by the door, I guess, and have them hand you each piece. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Well, I have a whole bottle of my Kamotsuru, and I think uh, as I drink this, um, I'm going to experiment over the coming days with uh, different food pairings, mm-hmm. and we'll see what shakes out to be good. But, you know, nice. I think something a little bit richer, something a little bit heavier might be good with this uh, dry finish, and uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Cool. Um, excellent. All right. Well, thank you everyone so much for tuning in. If you could take a moment, please rate our show on Apple podcasts. And to make sure you don't miss next week's episode or any episode after that, please, please go ahead and subscribe wherever you download your podcasts. And as always, to learn more about any of the topics we talked about today or any of the sakes we tried today, visit our website at sakerevolution.com to look at the detailed show notes. And please send us your feedback, show ideas, sakes you'd like us to taste. Uh, if you want to send the fire department to Tim's place because he's making <laughs> yakitori on his fire escape, you can do that. But also send an email anytime to feedback at sakerevolution.com. And until next time, remember to keep drinking sake and... Kampai! Kampai.